class, you were taught that exponential growth can be modeled by, well, growth function can be modeled by exponential function, correct? Okay, so let's see where that comes from. Here is a premise. Population, let's say, uh, I'm gonna change the color. Let's say population as a function of time. What kind of function can we expect? Is the question, right? Now, certain assumption, one assumption is this. This is a simplistic case. Change of rate of the population, derivative meaning rate, right? Change, population growth, is proportional to some kind of proportional constant times the population itself. Okay, here, P is your Y and T is your X, kind of, okay? So P is a function of T. Now, that kind of makes sense if you're looking at the primitive single cell or little multi-cell organism, see amoeba, things like that. Can you see my hand, right? One cell splits into two. And two, they don't give baby, they don't give a birth to babies, then then they become four, and then they become eight, right? But instead of starting with one, one, if you start with 1,000, the 1,000 will become 2,000, 4,000, 8,000. You know what I'm saying? So if you have a bigger population to start, then your growth rate is that much higher. That makes sense to you? So this is a very primitive type of organism. But there are a lot of those on Earth, so that model is this, okay? And then also, at the beginning, if this matters, at the beginning, let's say we have this amount of cells or bacteria, okay? If it's one that's tiny or at the beginning when we start this experiment in petri dish, how many bacteria are we looking at? Good? Now, then this is a highly separable differential equation. We have done it before, but we'll do it again. So dP over P is equal to K. You leave that K, don't be bringing K down here, and then dT, the right? Then we integrate both sides. So this becomes ln, right? Are you sure this is ln? Now, this, do we really need this absolute value? This is a population, so we don't need it. This is redundant now, isn't it? Right, or just put it in case this is anti-species, not real species, okay, whatever. And then the other side is K times T and plus C, A. Eh? Say yes. Okay, one way to figure that out is substitute this thingy now. So left-hand side becomes ln P naught. And then right hand side, T is equal to zero, so it's C. You know what I'm saying? So we have ln P now, substituting back into this equation, I'm going to drop the absolute value, is equal to KT plus C, which is ln P naught. You with me? You with me? Okay, continuing over here, so take E on both sides or rewrite it into exponential form. So then P is equal to E to the KT plus ln P. Now, very good. And then rule of exponents, right? So we can say P is equal to E to the KT times E to the ln P. Oh, E ln, right? Inverse function. So this is equal to P naught times E to the KT. How about that? See? Exponential model. Or last year, pre calc book put E to the RT here, but it's the same thing. Good. Now, but I taught you better way of doing this, right? The better way alternative is this. I'm gonna pick it up from here, okay? This line. So we have ln p is equal to kt plus c. Now we just take e on both sides. So we have p is equal to e to the kt plus c, right? And then that is equal to 
I'm going to write this first, like that, right? And then this whole thing is a constant, right? So we replace that with A or B or chi and C. And then I'm saying where A is equal to E to the C. You know what I'm saying? Now we apply the initial value at, okay, if you do that, this becomes P naught, and this T becomes zero, so E to the zero is one, so you have that, you get it? So then, therefore, we have P, which is function of T, becomes P naught times E to the KT. You get it? Are we good? Nothing new, right? Okay. Now then, oh, this is scary. We'll do that later. Half-life decay. Okay. Half-life decay, if it's going down, it's pretty much the same differential equation, except we insert negative sign here. Right? So is it, and then let's not use P because it's not population anymore. They're like atoms. So A is equal to your original amount and E to the negative KT, right? And this is what your chem teacher taught you, correct? Actually, this was in your pre book too. Now I'm going to give you, I'm going to derive, and this is exactly, Exactly the same differential equation, except we have a minus sign here. So we have minus sign here. Other than that, they look same. But, 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 I'm going to give you a little better derivation and better formula, okay, which is, which will appear in most physics books, okay? And this is just using logic and algebra skill, okay, not really. So we can derive the same thing instead of solving differential equation in calculus, we can just use simple algebra. Watch this. Suppose we have half-life. So half-life by ex definition is this. If you start with any original amount, let's say this is A naught, right? And then H years later, let's say this is H. H is the half-life of this, whatever the compound, right? In case of a carbon-14, oh, I I, why, why can't I remember the half-life of carbon-14? It's like 1,000, I forget, <laughs> don't, don't quote me, but so many thousands of years, you know what I'm saying? And one of these days, remind me to explain how that carbon dating and crime lab and fossil dating works, okay? A simple half-life that happens to be my major also is physics on top of applied math so this is my thing okay so that if you wait let's say it's like five thousand years later you will have half of this you know what i'm saying so this becomes your data point that makes sense to you the other half has decayed away carbon 14 decays into carbon 12 and they become just identical to the rest of the carbon. Good. Now, if you wait another 5,000 years or so, half-life, then you will have exactly half of whatever is left before. See, probability of each atom decaying in H years is exactly one half. Wait, uh, let me ask you this. When you're older, much older, over 21, and pandemics hopefully is over by then, so you get to go to Las Vegas. A lot of people go to Las Vegas for their 21st birthday. You know what I'm saying? This is Vegas, and then you, know, you, you are not allowed to walk on the casino, so you're like playing in swimming pool all day while your parents were doing whatever that they are doing on that casino floor. You know what I'm saying? So finally you get to go and then actually they give you these free stuff, drinks and stuff. So it's like, yeah, Vegas, baby, let's go. So you go to Vegas. Except you don't know how to play any games, right? 
So either you're sitting at the slot machine, which is like, ah, it looks boring. Actually, it's not that boring. Ah, it's boring. So only thing that you can make sense of by watching is roulette, of course, isn't it? This big wheel that's turning and there are so many numbers and red and black and odd and even and then dealer just tosses, right? And then, okay, you still don't know how this game works, but you can do odd and even. You can bet on odd or you can bet on even. You know what I'm saying? It's like flipping a coin. Or you can bet on bet on black or you can bet on red. Yeah, 50% on all this, like 48% problems. Okay, there are two green, zero and double zero, but it's okay. So yeah, you start. So most people get started by roulette and a bunch of people are standing at the table. So it's like, it's kind of exciting. It's Vegas, right? And then behind the dealer, there's a little panel, electronic scorecard kind of thing. And then they show you the history. And then you notice that it they has got like nine red in a row. Then you say, oh, it's about to happen. It's got to be black next. So you bet big on black. Is that reasoning good? No, it's like a coin flip. If you have a nine heads in a row, is it more likely to get a tail the tenth time in order to help the law of average? No. The coin does not know what happened. This the roulette table does not know what happened in the history. They don't remember. Likewise, each of this atom here, each individual carbon 14 atoms, it does not know how old it is. It does not know how many half life it survived. The probability within the next half life is exactly one half. You get it? That's why you get this kind of curve. That kind of makes sense because like you were all wondering why is it half life and why why does it work like that? That's why because these atoms don't have any memory. They don't have brain. They don't know. So next half life. Say 3H. Then there will be half of this. And then you see the picture now what's going on, right? It's always half of that, half of that, half of that. So if we connect them with a smooth, nice curve. It will be asymptotic. Are we good? I think with this picture, we can set up this differential equation. So A here as a function of T should be this, and then you can say this, right? T. But then if you write it like this, that's kind of that's not right because F one year becomes a half life. One year later it becomes half. This is one, two, three. No, 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 no. We have to adjust it. So we want to have a horizontal stretch. So we put H here, right? That way when T is equal to H, you have half. When T is equal to 2h you have 2 so 2 to the half power 1 force this is 1 force uh, and so on you know what i'm saying is that obvious and then of course most physics book physicists being who they are they will write it like this good say yes do you see they are the same thing? That was so much better than solving differential equations, just reasoning, right? I mean, you can teach this to algebra to, okay, I take that back. You can teach this to pre-calculus kids, right? Let's say pre calc limits kids can understand this much. Now, well then, we have a conflict. See, we have a physics book version and we have chemistry book version. Which one is right? Unless, of course, they are the same thing, right? Well, of course, they are the same thing. And here's my, I'm going to take off my physics, physicist hat, and I'm going to put on my mathematician hat now. Of course, it's job for mathematicians to prove to you that these two are the same thing. They've got to be, it's the same atom, right? So here comes the proof. So I'm going to do the proof in green. 2 to the negative t over 2. t 
t over h. This is t. Now has to be e to the negative kt. Oh, by the way, let's go back to chem book for a sec. What was k in chem book? It was ln2 over h, half-life, right? <gasps> you don't remember any chemistry now, do you? Why do I have to teach you chemistry as well? Shouldn't you be better than... See, by the time you're honor students in high school, you should be better than all of your teachers in all subjects except one. You know what I'm saying? You should be, I'm, I, math should be the only thing that I'm better than you and English, for example, or history, anything else, you should be better than me, right? So why am I teaching you physics and chemistry as well? What is wrong with you kids? <laughs> okay, that's how it was in Kemberg. You can look it up. So I'm going to convert this into those two, okay? Do you remember how to change the base of the exponential function? We did it like this, chi and e, and ln, and then two to the negative t over h is how we did it, right? And then these are inverse functions, so they appear to cancel. And then this thing go to the front. So what we have is e to the negative t over 2h, correct? Let me rearrange that slightly. So that's e to the negative h over 2. Uh, what the? Not like that. What did I do? h over, this is not even correct. Oh my God, right? Uh, messed up. This go to the front, so we have t over h and then ln2, correct? Now it's right. So if I rearrange it, ln2 over h t. You know what I'm saying? And then, of course, you can see this is negative kt, where k is ln2 over h. How about that? Huh? Chemistry version. So they are really the same thing. Very good. Well, but then this is infinitely nicer, isn't it? Instead of having two different things to worry about. So why? Why, why, what is the reason behind this? You have to wonder now. Okay, I'll tell you that reason after I finish the terminal velocity derivation because we are running on short on time.